Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our Facebook Live discussion. We're joined today by Dr. Kari Adamson, plastic surgeon, to discuss deep flap reconstruction reconstruction surgery. Um, now available to patients at Plastic Surgery and Skin Specialists by Baycare Clinic. We're here to talk about the surgical process, what benefits this new option provides for patients needing reconstructive breast surgery in our area. Thank you for being here, Dr. Adamson. Thanks for having me. Again, Dr. Adamson is here to answer your questions today. So before we get started, I wanna remind everyone that if you do have questions about breast reconstruction surgery or options available to patients in our area, we encourage you to ask them in the comments below. We'll incorporate your questions into our discussion today and then answer them in real time. Again, this is your opportunity to speak directly with Dr. Adamson, so please do take advantage of that. If we run out of time before answering your questions, we'll go ahead and respond online after the live broadcast as well. So Dr. Adamson, why don't we go ahead and get started? I want to talk about the deep flap reconstruction specifically. So can you tell us a little bit more about that procedure, maybe what that stands for and then what's actually done during that procedure? Yeah, so the deep flap um, is a procedure that we use for breast reconstruction after mastectomy. And we take tissue that we would normally throw away in a tummy tuck and use it to reconstruct a breast. Um, we use the blood vessels that go to that tissue and connect to blood vessels in the chest. So it's basically like a transplant to yourself. Um, deep flap stands for deep inferior epigastric perforator, and that's the vessels that go to that tissue. So that's why it has that name. Fantastic. Can you talk a little bit about how that maybe differs from other breast reconstruction options that, that patients may or may not be familiar with? So other types of breast reconstruction would be implant-based reconstruction, um, starting with an expander or implant, saline or silicone. Um, and other types of breast reconstruction include using either a muscle from the back or transferring tissue from the abdomen with the skin fat and muscle. Yeah, so we're gonna get into the details of that procedure in just a minute, but I wanna back up slightly and talk a little bit about your training and expertise. Can you tell us sort of what makes you uniquely qualified to perform this surgery here and maybe some of the training that you've had? So I did my six year plastic surgery residency at Medical College of Wisconsin, uh, very close to my home. And then I did a lot of deep flap procedures during that time. Actually, my partner, Dr. O'Connor, uh, was also a resident in the same program. I then went on to MD Anderson Cancer Center for a fellowship um, specializing in flap surgeries and cancer reconstruction. And so in that year, I did over 100 flap procedures. And then I went into academic practice um, where I was doing flaps and deep flaps every week. Very interesting. And, and I want to talk about that specifically because I think your training kind of lends to a lot of experience that you're bringing to plastic surgery and skin specialists by Baycare Clinic. You joined the department in January. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what this opportunity and what your skills and expertise provide for patients in our area? Yeah, so I think um, coming here, we really can offer all of the reconstruction options to patients. Um, my partners have a lot of experience in breast reconstruction and also other types of flaps. So together, we have spent the last few months really setting up a great operating room team, nursing team, anesthesia team, all familiar with protocols and how we like to do these procedures. Um, we're doing the surgeries together to be more efficient. Um, limit the patient's time in the operating room and the amount of anesthesia time. So really, um, patients can have this procedure or any type of breast cancer reconstruction close to home, um, which also just makes it easier for follow-ups and any type of touch-up surgeries. Yeah, and I want to talk about that because previously people would have to travel some level of hours to, to have this procedure done. Can you talk about what that means for patients just in terms of that follow-up care like you mentioned? Yeah, so patients, if they come to see us, are going to have all options of breast cancer reconstruction. Um, so if they decide to go with the deep flap, for instance, then they can know that they're going to have um, experience, they're going to have excellent care, um, and they're going to have it close to home. So if anything were to go wrong, they're a short distance um, from being able to see us, or even if they just need reassurance, 
um, you know, want to get a drain out a little bit early, that type of thing, they're not too far. That's great. Uh, we're going to get into, a, as I mentioned, the specifics of the procedure and, and sort of how you can work with your um, colleagues and in, in do this for patients in the in the short term. But I want to talk first and just remind everyone um, that we're here with Dr. Kari Adamson, plastic surgery, uh, plastic surgeon discussing surgical breast reconstruction options available to patients, specifically the deep flap procedure, which is now available at Plastic Surgery and Skin Specialist by Baker Clinic. Um, as a reminder, we are taking your questions today, so feel free to ask them in the comments if you do have them. Uh, if you don't have questions, but you're following along and you're liking the way the conversation is going, go ahead and give us the thumbs up just to let us know that you're listening. So I, you had mentioned specifically all of the options that are available to patients within your practice and with your colleagues. Uh, with the, in conjunction with patients, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what it's like deciding which surgical options are right for each patient, because obviously there are differences. So can you talk a little bit about that conversation and that relationship? Yeah, so a lot of the decision comes down to patient preference. Um, and some patients are looking for something that feels more natural or feels more like themselves. And some patients are looking, you know, to change their volume and breast um, or, you know, have other reasons why they might choose a different option. Um, so I also take into consideration whether the patient has a history of radiation or if they're going to need radiation. If that's the case, they may need some skin replaced. Um, so a deep flap may be a good option for those patients. Patients who have had implants, um, but they failed for one reason or another, may be a good candidate. Um, and patients who have a little extra abdominal skin and fat, um, you know, it's a good silver lining to be able to kind of get rid of that and put it to good use. Some patients may not have enough tissue for deep flap. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the decision comes down to an exam. Yeah, and you just talked about it too. So I want to talk specifically about deep flap and, and the situations where deep flap would be a really good procedure for somebody, but then on the flip side, maybe where it wouldn't be. So could you elaborate a little on that? Yep. So um, I do think it's great for patients who have had radiation, have had an implant go wrong, um, but also patients who have larger breasts um, we're kind of limited in the maximum implant size that we have. So just to give you a proportional result, um, sometimes using your own tissue is a good way to go. Um, and then did you say who would not be a good candidate? Yeah, on the flip side, maybe where it wouldn't be a great option for some patients. Yeah. So anyone who's had an abdominoplasty or a tummy tuck, those vessels usually are not there anymore. So they may not be a candidate. Um, patients who really have a very um, limited amount of skin and fat may not be a candidate. Um, if you are planning to have children in the future, you may want to delay that type of procedure as well. Uh -huh. So I want to walk through the surgery for, for patients who have decided and, and you've helped decide that this is the right procedure. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like for each patient? Yeah, so after we make the decision to move forward with the deep flap, then I order a CT scan, which will look at the vessels of the tissue, um, just to make sure that we have a good plan and that we can predict a good outcome. Um, and then we look to schedule surgery. So if we need to combine that with mastectomy timing, um, we'll do that if the patient hadn't already had mastectomies. Um, then we would, you know, plan to head to the operating room. We do a preoperative visit, go through everything really extensively shortly before surgery. Um, and then the day of you meet the anesthesia team, we have a protocol um, to try to decrease the amount of opioids that you need. Um, and so the anesthesia team helps us with that. Um, and then we do our surgery, um, start right away in the morning. It's pretty much an all day type of thing. Uh, and then you're admitted to the hospital for about three days. Uh -huh. Yeah, and just by your description there, it sounds like there's a lot of people, a lot of specialists that are working together. Can you talk more about what that collaborative environment is like and what the benefit is for patients? Absolutely. So I do think it's important um, that this surgery is done at a place where there is some experience and you have teams working together um, and kind of people who are point people and specialized 
So um, we have an operative team, our techs are familiar and have gotten extra training, our circulating nurses, um, our org coordinator to make sure that we have all the right supplies. Um, and then even in the recovery room, those nurses have extra training. The nurses um, after admission have extra training. And then we're obviously very hands-on as the surgeons. Um, so a lot of people um, who have all spent a lot of time getting together and making sure that we have things kind of as smooth as can be. Yeah, that's great. And I want to talk specifically too, because you had mentioned you actually performed this procedure with your colleagues at Plastic Surgery and Skin Specialists by Baycare Clinic. So talk about that dual performance and, and the benefits of that, not only for you guys as surgeons, but also for the patients themselves. Yeah, it allows us to be working simultaneously so we can work on the chest and the abdomen at the same time, keep things moving, and then we assist each other under the microscope um, where it's beneficial to have some extra hands. Um, it also allows us to take a little bathroom break if we need to do that during the surgery too. So um, I think it just helps everyone stay focused, efficient, and keep the day moving. Yeah, and you mentioned that because it can be an all-day process. About how long do these procedures last, and obviously, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? A little bit case-by-case, -case, um, but I would say anywhere from five hours to 10 hours for one um, or two sides, um, kind of anywhere in between, depending on the patient and their anatomy. Yeah, and I think that speaks to some of the intricacies that we'll get into in just a moment revolving around microsurgery, another one of your specialties. But first, I do want to address the fact that some people may have found in their research of DPLAP that it can be done at the same time as mastectomies. Can you talk a little bit about that and um, what you found just in your practice and your training about related to that? Yeah, so um, deflaps can definitely be done the same day as mastectomies. Um, at this time, we're offering it um, staged, so one to two weeks after mastectomies, um, and we're not the only ones doing it that way. I think a lot of us have seen um, better chances of the skin having good survival, um, you know, less likelihood of losing the nipple if you give the skin a chance to recover after the mastectomies and do the flap a little bit later. And I think there are some advantages too to starting this kind of longer procedure in the morning with a fresh team, um, being able to have your crew, you know, there for their entire shift and not having like a middle of the day shift change. Um, so I think all around, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a bummer for patients to have two different procedures, but at the end, I think the result is better. Um, and the recovery is really only a little bit longer, you know, the week or two that we're waiting. Mm -hmm. That's great. And we'll get into some of the, the, you know, the success stories that you've seen too with this procedure in just a moment, but I want to talk specifically about, uh, microsurgery and the portion of this procedure that actually, um, involves microsurgery. So can you talk a little bit about what you're doing in microsurgery and what part of uh, the deep flap procedure actually utilizes that technique? Yeah, so much of the deep flap is what I would consider microsurgery, where we're working around little vessels in this case. Um, I use some special glasses with telescopes that have magnification to um, get the vessels out from within the rectus muscle. And then um, we use those same um, glasses with the telescopes to dissect the vessels in the chest. They're really only a couple millimeters in diameter. Um, so then when we're ready to connect the vessels, we bring in a microscope um, and that gives us you know, quite a bit of magnification. Um, it has two heads, so two surgeons can be looking into it at the same time. And then we actually repair the vessels using the microscope um, and some suture that's about the thickness of a hair. Wow. Yeah, that sounds pretty incredible. Can you talk about the way that's different maybe than the way it's done in the past or the advancements in that type of technology? Yeah, previously, um, you know, it was more common to rotate a muscle, leaving it attached to the blood vessels. So whether that's a muscle from the back, the latissimus, latissimus muscle, or um, skin and fat and the rectus abdominis muscle from the abdomen, um, you know, it was less technically demanding, I think, to rotate um, and leave the vessels attached, but there are some downsides to sacrificing a muscle um, and also can lead to, you know, a, a little bit blunter shape in some instances too. Perfect. 
Can you talk um, a little bit about microsurgery in general and, and sort of the trends that you're seeing, not only in plastic surgery, but in the industry in general? Is this a technique that you're seeing um, more and more surgeons take advantage of? Yeah, definitely. So in plastic surgery training um, and even in other residencies too, residents are getting more exposure to microsurgery, um, working around little vessels and nerves um, and transferring tissue, you know, doing these flaps. Um, there are also more fellowship programs available and more people taking advantage of those fellowships um, after completion of residency. So I think we are seeing an increased um, amount of people who um, are offering this procedure. And I think therefore there are more patients choosing to go that route. Yeah, and I think, you know, just from a technical standpoint, this can all sound very complicated and things like that. But from a patient standpoint and what what people really want to know is sort of more of those benefits and what that actually means for them as patients. So can you elaborate a little bit on not only the advantages of microsurgery, but of the deep flap procedure as far as the advantages for patients? Yeah. Um, so the advantages of microsurgery and, and flaps is that we can completely remove tissue from one part of the body and move it to another. So we can really choose the best tissue for the defect. Um, and we can avoid taking things that we don't need to take. So um, for the deep flap, by leaving the rectus muscle where it should be, um, hopefully you have a stronger core and a lower risk of hernias. Um, it can also be applied to other um, defects not related to breast cancer. You know, we can use these principles to move tissue for trauma reconstruction, um, other types of cancer reconstruction. Um, you know, we can kind of use these techniques in many different ways. Yeah, and you segued perfectly because I know one of the reasons you came to plastic surgery and skin specialists by Baker Clinic was that transfer expertise. So can you talk about what that type of procedure and what microsurgery and these opportunities mean for the practice as a whole? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, my partners already had experience doing a lot of these um, types of techniques. Um, I think I bring some expertise in the deep flap in particular, um, but also just some fresh ideas, um, another pair of hands, another, um, you know, set of eyes. Um, and so just being able to offer patients different options, new options um, for really all types of wounds, defects, um, you know, cancer defects. That's perfect. So I do want to circle back to the deep flap procedure because we um, haven't talked about sort of the after portion of it. So once a patient um, receives the deep flap procedure, how does recovery look or what is that like? What does the stay look like in the hospital and, and afterwards? Yeah, so patients are in the hospital for three days and during that time we're just monitoring the tissue closely to make sure that those vessels are flowing like they should. Um, after the three days, then patients go home, and at that point, we're not too worried about the blood flow anymore. And over time, your, your other vessels grow into the tissue, so you don't need to worry about that long term. The restrictions continue on for six weeks, so no heavy lifting, um, no vigorous activity. Um, patients are pretty sore for the first week or two. Um, but they're typically off of opioids um, or narcotics in the first week. Um, I do tell patients, though, that the deep flap is kind of an investment in your time and energy up front. So it's a, it's a long recovery. You know, it's a couple weeks of feeling tired. But the best part is that once your reconstruction is done, um, you know, and often we'll do a touch-up procedure after the big surgery. But once you're done, then that lasts you forever. And it'd be very rare to have surgery uh, later on. Yeah, and I wanted to talk about that too. So just because this is newer to our area and newer for patients specifically, how does that differ from maybe the recovery time from for some of the other procedures or even the implant-based ones? Yeah, so for implants, um, a lot of times patients will stay in the hospital for one night. I, I still have them on six weeks of restrictions, but they bounce back faster. Um, we usually do a second stage for implant-based reconstruction as well. And then implants aren't made to last forever. So on average, they're replaced in about 10 years. Um, and so there is some maintenance required in addition to potentially imaging that might be required if you have implants in place. Um, for other types of flaps, 
um, like a tram flap, um, you know, the hospital stay was typically a bit longer than what we're seeing for deep flaps now. Mm -hmm. and, and specifically for people who don't know, the other types of flaps, can you elaborate on what that means as far as where you're taking the fat from or, or the tissue from and that kind of thing, just to clarify? Yeah. So um, tram flap was uh, sort of the um, early version of a deep flap. And so similar skin and fat is removed, but the rectus abdominis muscle went with it. So that um, is transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap is what it stands for. Perfect. So if I am someone um, in need of breast reconstruction surgery, what, what steps should I take or what, what are my first options from your perspective? Yeah, so if um, if the patient hasn't had mastectomies yet, or let's say you are at high risk of breast cancer, um, and you know, then first we need to get you to our breast surgical oncologist, um, and they help decide the best cancer operation. Um, but after that, you know, is typically when you would meet with us. If you're a patient who has already had breast cancer um, treatment, um, potentially mastectomy, um, or any type of reconstruction or not, um, then we're happy to see you, you know, first right away at um, our Big Care Plastic Surgery Clinic. Um, and you can meet with me or any of my partners. We all offer the same thing. Um, and as I mentioned, we work together. So we're happy to talk to you about all of your options, look at your unique case and answer any questions you might have. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for spending some time to, with us today, Dr. Adamson. We really appreciate it. Is there anything else that you want to add? Um, just that I'm really excited to be here. Um, I am really blown away by my group, my partners. Um, so I'm thrilled that we're offering this together. And so far, it's been a really smooth start. So I'm glad to continue that. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate you being here as well. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, if you have additional questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments below. We'll continue to answer those online after the live broadcast. Again, Dr. Kari Adamson is a plastic surgeon at Plastic Surgery and Skin Specialist by Bay Care Clinic. She sees patients currently in Green Bay. Her colleagues see patients in Green Bay, Kakana, Oshkosh, and Marinette. If you want to learn more about Bay Care Clinic or request an appointment with one of our providers, please visit baycareplasticsurgery.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you.